time when a similar, uh, similar uh, uh, circumstances in which they asked everybody who was in the balcony to come down front. So we're going to ask all you guys uh, who are back there to come on down front here. And we will have a more intimate experience. A That's, that sounds creepy. A conversation with Rod Thompson. Circumstances were only slightly the same because it was also not a very big play because this is a big play. Well. So welcome to the Common Read. Sponsored by the English Department and the Southeastern, Southeastern Writing Center uh, on the Common Read author for fall for spring 2023 is Mr. Rod Thompson. He is the author of The Cost of These Dreams, Sports Stories, and Other Serious Business, and Pappy Land, the story of family, fine bourbon, and things that last. Before ESPN, his career included newspaper journalism, uh, working for the Times Picayune and the Kansas City Star. But above all, he is a man who, as we discovered today in the earlier session, uh, is someone who learns to listen well to other people's stories, uh, to empathize and to understand people, and to weave those into extraordinarily interesting essays. Mr. Ron Thompson. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I mean, I honestly wanted to be at the other one, so I'm very grateful. Uh, the, uh, I feel like I need a DJ. So what I thought we'd do is I'm gonna read just a little bit. One of the things I've learned from doing many readings is that no one actually wants you to read at a reading because uh, it's often stultifyingly boring. Uh, so I just am gonna read and then talk about the book a little bit and then uh, super informal, let's have questions. Uh, you know, we could talk about this book, we could talk about the bourbon book. Uh, I cannot get any of you any Pappy Van Winkle. Uh, you know, and just whatever. This is a story I wrote about, so I got a call from somebody who works at the University of Alabama who told me that Bear Bryant's driver was old and sick and was starting to suffer from dementia and uh, didn't, had turned down, you know, lived a very modest life and had turned down big money to write a book because he knew where all the bodies were buried and he knew all of the secrets, and he just refused to do it. It was this guy who just lived in, lived in Tuscaloosa and refused to sort of burn the coach. And uh, I went and spent a couple of days with him, and it just, it's a story about memory, and uh, I really like stories about memory, and so I thought I'd read a little bit of this, talk about the book, and then uh, see what you guys want to talk about. Each rising sun takes a little more from the couple who live in the small brick home southwest of downtown. Something important is being lost. Billy Varner has been married to Susie for 57 years, and as her life was once spent waiting on him to get home from a job that didn't know hours or days off, now it's spent managing his dementia. Each day brings its own reality. On the worst days, Billy, who is 76, doesn't recognize Susie. He'll dress in the middle of the night and try to leave, his pajamas rolled up in his hand. Regularly, he refuses to believe that his old boss isn't at home waiting for a ride. Billy was Bear Bryant's driver, bodyguard, and valet, one of the few remaining people who knew him as a human being. As Billy's memory fades, that knowledge disappears with it, widening the gulf between truth and imagination. Billy tells Susie that he talks to the coach and that sometimes Bryant visits. Coach Bryant isn't dead, he'll say. Don't tell me he's dead. Billy, Susie says, yes he is. Uh, I picked that because, I mean, I feel like the best part about this weird job I get to do is that you get to be there for 
people doing the real stuff of living and dying. And some of these people are very, very famous and some are people you've never heard of. I think that that sort of disappears quickly. Uh, you know, uh, everybody, whether they're Michael Jordan or Billy Varner or Tiger Woods or whomever really, uh, one, it's interesting because like, I don't think like I, it's not like I know something other people don't know, but I have had front row seats to a lot of stuff. And I feel like the collection of those experiences, uh, you know, whether you read them or whether you went and, you know, did them like I did, they, they, they tie something together about the human experience. And I feel like I've learned things about Billy Varner struggling with his own mind, about uh, you know, Michael Jordan struggling with the fact that he's no longer Michael Jordan. And so uh, one of the things, because this is sponsored by an English department, uh, that I really want to talk about that is essential in all of your own storytelling or writing or whatever it is you're doing is this idea of that the story lives inside people. That it's not, you know, them walking through the world. It's, you know, almost always our greatest battles are against ourselves and almost always our greatest battles are against things inside of us. Uh, I took a class at, in college. Uh, my mom was an English major and I remember calling her after the first day of a class that was entitled the, in, the Interiority of Tennessee Williams. And I called and was like, I'm taking a class and I don't know what interiority means. And I feel like that's a problem when it's in the name of the class. And so, uh, you know, that, that really, that's what the job is. And so, like for instance, with Michael Jordan, uh, let me, here, let me pull a little bit up. So Michael Jordan, one of, the, one of the really fascinating things about Michael Jordan is that he is remarkably self-aware. Like, he told me the story one time that uh, he had a, they're now married, he had a fiance, and when they started dating, uh, she's from Miami and is Cuban, and her grandparents don't speak any English and didn't really know who he was. Like they knew he was rich, and they knew that people reacted to him, but they had no sort of cultural awareness or cultural literacy of who Michael Jordan was. And so he went to their house for Easter, and they had dinner. And I was talking to him about it, and he said, that is, it was the first day in 20-something years where every single detail of the day hadn't been organized around my whim. And I know I'm supposed to say that I found that refreshing, but I hated it. Like I hated not being able to do exactly what I wanted to do every single moment of the day. And you know, he, he, we sat down and talked, he's like, I'm just so entitled. You know, his, he has a security team because he gets all sorts of threats. And uh, so he has all of these ex secret service and sort of special ops guys who are contractors and they have code names for everybody in his sort of orbit and his is Yahweh and it's not a compliment, you know. <laughs> It, and so, you know, he, he's so aware that his worst impulses were gardened at the expense of his best ones to make him good at his job and is so aware that now those things are the greatest obstacles to him getting to enjoy the fruits of the first part of his life. Like he's just hyper aware of the fact that, you know, hi, he's the problem, it's him. You know what I mean? Like he's just hyper aware that uh, he needed to change in order to even enjoy having been Michael Jordan. And like, I feel like that's something that, I feel like that's universal. And you know, hopefully like the connections of things in this book, whether they're about very, very famous people or about you know, people, you've, characters you've never ever heard of, it's that, that that they all know that, and that they're all dealing with things that we all deal with. I mean, I feel like you know, you kind of joke sometimes and call something a college newspaper story because it's like about the one-legged blonde wrestler or something, you know. And it's like you don't realize at the beginning that you don't need to be searching out stories about the thing that's different. You need to, you know, find the thing that's universal in all of us. Uh, you know, I write a lot about place and family, uh, 
for those reasons as well. I mean, I think, you know, everybody is from somewhere and from some people and very often most of the work we do on ourselves is about those two relationships. You know, I, uh, uh, it's all very, very internal and I don't know, that's becoming very important to me. I, uh, you know, you know, you do a thing like this and, 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 you know, you sort of fire it out into the world and it isn't yours anymore. And so, you know, the story in here about my father hopefully is about your father. And the story in here about New Orleans after Katrina hopefully is about wherever you're from. And the story about Michael Jordan trying to figure out how to silence his own worst demons is hopefully about you trying to do the same, whether that's, you know, whatever it might be. And so the thing I'm always really going for with this or with really any project is for something to be, you know, universal. And uh, that's what it's about. I mean, the title, which is from a, a song lyric from a band called The Drive-By Truckers, is that, you know, this idea that nothing is for free and that, uh, you know, I am here instead of being somewhere else. Uh, probably that party down there, actually. Uh, but, like, everybody is making choices. And I think it's the job of the storyteller to, I don't know, try to, by understanding one person's decisions, hopefully give something to the reader as a, as a matrix for understanding their own. Uh, I mean, that's... Uh, I mean, that's certainly what I, that's certainly what I'm trying to do. Uh, you know, as he hinted at in the introduction, like I do a lot of different stuff. I mean, I, I write books, I write for ESPN, I run a television show, uh, uh, make documentaries, and so I have fingers in a lot of different things. And you know, the, I find that all, they're all basically essentially the same. You know, I'm a walker. This is a lot better. The, you know, they're basically all essentially the same. And, you know, they, every one of them is, should be, if it's working, an act of empathy, right? I mean, that, like, I'm here in the world and uh, trying to, like, strip away a little bit of the fear. And, uh, you know, I try to understand myself and understand you, and hopefully we all understand each other. And, I mean, that that is... I mean, that was absolutely the intent with every one of these stories. And uh, I mean, frankly, when I was picking them, trying to decide what to leave in and what to leave out, uh, that was kind of the bar. Like, that was the eye of the needle they had to pass through. Because like, there, there are ones that I like that, that aren't in there, and it was just because, like, on a certain level, they weren't doing that. Like, they weren't at their core an act of understanding or curiosity or, or whatever. Uh, I am curious... Uh, this is actually different faces a lot from this morning, so that's good. Uh, and I'm wondering if we want to like take some questions or what kind of things you guys might want to talk about. Or, you know, I think there we'll probably get to everybody a couple of times actually. So no, but this could be really fun. Like there, you could actually just like, you know, we, we could really chop it up. Uh, so is there anything anybody like really wants to talk about? Oh, there we go. Pappy Land is half the story of Julian Van Winkle. So do you know, all right, so Pappy Van Winkle is like the world's most sought after bourbon. And so basically what happened was Julian Van Winkle, who's alive now, his grandfather uh, built this incredible business that his father then lost. And so Julian, his whole life, he built it back. You know, I, when I first met him, I sort of thought he was like one of those dudes who was born on third base and thought he hit a triple, you know, like, and, uh, but, it, so it, it's a story of a guy inheriting an idea about himself and his family, but not, but having to go out and also make it come true. And so I spent like three or four years with him. And one of the things that's really interesting is that, because they make whiskey, so it sits in a bottle, or it sits in a barrel, excuse me for 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or 23 years, depending on which one it is. And it just makes him, he just experiences time in a different way than we do. And like, he doesn't, 
he's forever playing the long game. I mean, the whiskey that they're putting in barrels right now, he won't live to see bottled. You know, it's like, what's the quote? It's the wise man that plants a tree under the shade of which he'll never enjoy or whatever that quote is. I mean, so it's very seductive because like I am on this stupid thing constantly. Like all I want in the world is to not have this. And uh, I mean, I work for a cable news network. I mean, there is no more ADD rat brain thing in, in the world. And so it's very seductive to be around him because he just lives like, he's one of those people who like enjoys every meal he has. You know, he, he, he started to be like Yoda to me. You know, like I really started to be like, like I'm doing everything wrong and I need to watch this dude and figure out how to like be better. And it, cause it's really seductive to think you could live that way where he's just like not, he doesn't sweat the small stuff at all. So I spent all this time with him and originally I was just going to write a history of the distillery, but I sort of felt like the most interesting version of the time I had with him was all of our conversations that had very little to do with whiskey. And so the book is half the story of Van Winkle and it's probably a third the story of Van Winkle, a third a memoir of me, and a third a buddy movie of the time he and I ran around together for a couple of years. Uh, uh, the tax write-offs were great. The, uh, but it's about that. My wife calls it eat, pray, love for dads. <laughs> I think that's a compliment, but like some days I'm not entirely sure. Yes, sir. Not really, usually like, because I kind of report a book I found on all of them, and by the time that story runs, I'm just sick of, I'm, I'm sick of them, I'm sick of it, I'm sick of all of it, and like, you know, you're just done. And also, like, what's that great Mark Twain quote? Like, I'm sorry this letter is so long, it'd have been shorter if I'd have had more time. Like, there's something about that length that is actually harder that I really like. And like, it, you know, when one of those things is really good, it's perfect. In a book, all, you know, all I could ever do is see the mistakes. Because it's just, you, there's a level of perfection you can do there that I like. All right, what do we got? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Uh, the question was, anyone gotten mad? Uh, one guy was really mad because the story ran, and then two days later, uh, he... Uh, he and his wife went in for their regularly scheduled marriage counseling, and she reached into her bag and pulled out the magazine and threw it down on the table and said, see, I told you. So that wasn't great. He was really mad. I was right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, no, people have been really mad. Uh, I'm trying to think of some good ones. I mean, I've been yelled at. There have been some death threats, but like none that I took seriously. The weirdest thing is... It's actually the opposite of that. It's when somebody really loves it. Like, I get weird mail. And I don't know how they find out my address. And, like, really weird mail. Like, this guy sent me his high school state football championship ring. That's weird. It's very weird. And I didn't know what to do about it. Because, I like, I'm like, is this the kind of thing where if I, like, send this back, he's going to make a lampshade out of my face? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was a little, I was like, this is really, so, no, that part, like, you get some weird stuff. Uh, it is sitting in the envelope that it came in uh, in my laundry room, <laughs> where it's been for several years. I didn't know what to do with it. It really freaked me out. Uh, and then a really long letter with like, you know, there, there's a, for some reason, there's some sort of direct correlation between the size of someone's handwriting and how batshit crazy they are. <laughs> and so it was really, I was like, this is not good. But yes, the mad ones are kind of funny. Uh, it makes me really good in an argument because I've been yelled at by like really scary people. Uh, Nick Saban tried to get me fired. Uh, the old sports editor of the Times, Picayune, pour one out. Uh, this isn't so funny now because of what happened to the newspaper, but Nick tried to get me fired and the sports editor told him, Nick, the Times Picayune has come out every morning for 171 years. We made it through the Civil War, we made it through Huey Long, and we're gonna make it through you. Uh, but yeah, he was really mad. 
He was mad because I wrote a story about all the cheating that they were doing that got picked up on the wire services that his mother read and called him about. Because <laughs> his mom was pissed at him, so he was mad at me. I, th I think it's pretty clear that he went crazy, uh, but I sort of wanted that to be up to each individual reader. Like, I didn't want to make my, she's talking about a guy who was playing professional basketball in Brazil and all of a sudden told everybody that uh, people were chasing him and he ran from the big city he was in out into the country and then ran onto a Brazilian army, art like artillery range and then uh, was either murdered or killed himself. And that's the question. Uh, I think it's, you know, I still get Christmas cards from his wife. Like, uh, they show up every year. It's like, well, I guess once you get on somebody's list, but uh, no. Well, one of my kids was so concerned about it. He's saying, he's like, I just feel like she needs some closure. And I was like, no, there is no closure. We had a bunch of hands up a second ago. There we go. Uh, the question is, what advice would you give to someone who, you know, maybe write a book one day? Uh, I mean, this sounds so simplistic and like I don't, but like read and write. Uh, you know, uh, get really good at a thousand words and then get really good at two thousand words and then get really good at five and then get really good at, you know, I worked in newspapers for five years and never wrote anything longer than 3,600 words. And I felt like I knew that I had that length. I knew what worked in it, I knew what didn't, I knew what I needed. Uh, all of my stories, for a long time, they were all between sort of seven and 8,000 words. Now they're usually between sort of 10 and 12. And I think your brain just starts seeing stories with certain sweep. And so you kind of know what you need to do. And I mean, one of the trickiest parts for me about writing a book is having to sort of, you have to hold it all in your head. And so like, you need the earlier wins to be confident enough through months and months and months of doubt that it's going to work. Because like, I know pretty quickly if it, one of these stories is working or not. Like, you know, th this thing I'm writing right now, I like all the individual parts. It's way too early for me to he hit it. You know, it's like this roller coasters, you gotta go real slow and then you do the, then, you know. And it's, it's way too early for me to know if all of the stuff I'm doing now is gonna work. And so if, you know, if I didn't have confidence through like sort of past successes, I think I would be having a literal nervous breakdown. So I mean, I think, I think writing a book is not hard. I think surviving the writing of a book is hard. And I think like, you just wanna make sure that you're not gonna melt your face. We had a biographer, I'll give a presentation a couple of years ago. Um, he was talking about the shape of the biography. He was writing a biography of Eisenhower. Uh, he's on a second volume. He's projecting like a four volume or six enormous biography. Yes. But, and so you know, he, was, he was talking about he's framing it himself at that, at that scale. Uh, so a biographer who works like that is, I guess, imagining a reader who wants to know every possible thing about Eisenhower. What, what you have to, or else, like, you know, how would you keep going? I mean, like, you know, the restraining yourself is interesting because I'm constantly worried, like, I'm giving this out too soon. I'm giving it out too soon. So what I've been doing is just writing it in multiple places, and then later I'll go back and figure out which one stays and which ones die. But it's, it's, it's for that exact thing because I know if I do that, uh, then I won't be stressed about it. I mean, I think a lot of all of this stuff, a lot of writing is figuring out systems to manage your own crazy. You know, I mean, I think, and I think everybody is different and everybody's crazy is different. And uh, I mean, I think a lot of it is just constructing a world that allows you to not just totally go nuts. Because it's just a lot to hold in your head. And so there are times when I'll just be sitting there and 
our five-year-old will just start screaming. And I, you know, it's literally like I could feel the book running out of my ears. And I'm like, I gotta get out of this room. <laughs> But you're, but you're not imagining a reader that wants to know everything about it. No, no, and honestly, uh, I'm not imagining a reader at all. No, I, I don't, uh, I mean me. I just, I want to like it. And I sort of think that if I like it, other people will like it. But like, uh, nobody is going to be harder on me than me. And so I just, that's, that's the thing. Because I hate everything. You know, and, uh, uh, I don't ever go back, I hate this. Like, I don't ever go back and read these stories. Like, I edited the Jordan story in this book because there was a line that ran in the magazine that I hated so much that it made me almost like not want to talk about it. So when they reprinted it for this, my one thing I changed in all of these stories was I took that line out. Because I just, I felt like I'd defeated the universe, like I'd gone back in time or something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Obviously, things have changed. Since yes. Since then. So, like, a lot of the, the essays are snapshots. You know, like, it's not Jordan just buying Jordan books. Yeah. Like, how does that, how do you, like, do you ever go back and I wish I could write that now? Well, sure, but I mean, they, I want all of them on a certain level to feel like letters from blank. So, you know, they, they should be dispatches from a time and a place. Like, they're just, they're supposed to be true then. Because I think, like, you know, I, 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 they all need to be like of a time and a place. And so it becomes interesting because some of them get more true and then some of them you have to eat because you were like really wrong about somebody, you know, uh, like cosmically, like not the facts. Like, you know, I wrote this story about Johnny Manziel that just gets more and more true with each <laughs> passing year, you know, and it's like, uh, uh, I mean, I was with him at the height of his success and I was just like, this is a disaster. You know, he had these idiot friends, and like, it, you, you just knew that, like, and you know, and everybody hates the NCAA for good reason because, you know, he had all of the problems of fame, but none of the ways, he didn't have the money or the ability to create a bubble. So he had all of the problems of fame, but none of the good stuff. And he couldn't go to class because he was getting mobbed on campus. And the NCAA wouldn't let Texas A&M drive him to class on a golf cart because not every student got a golf cart. So he stopped going to class because he literally couldn't get there. You know, I mean, and, and, you know, you could just see the wheels coming off and no one, every adult around him was getting rich on him and no one would help him. And the only person in his life who saw what a disaster it was becoming was his father who felt totally helpless because his, his dad literally said to me, one day in three years, I'm going to pick up the phone and it's going to be the police somewhere. And it was like his dad saw it all happening. And, you know, these coaches and men, like people were making a fortune off of Johnny Menzel and no one helped him. And you could just see it coming. And he did a lot of it himself, too. I mean, he's an idiot, but I mean, he was. You know, he was a 19-year-old mega celebrity, you know. It's like that, at that roast of Justin Bieber, he was like, you know, what happens if you give someone with no father $400 million? This, you know, and he was really funny about it, but it was like, yeah, you could just see that breaking, uh, you know. But so some of them get more true and then some of them don't, you know. Had one on Urban Meyer, where he didn't make it through his first day without, you know, I was there for his first week at Ohio State. And like, you know, he prom made all these promises and I don't remember and like, he didn't make it through the first day without ha having a meltdown. Uh, that was scary, he was screaming, he wasn't even screaming at me and I was just like, oh, God damn, I'm glad he is not screaming at me. Yes, sir. It's things I'm curious about or interested in. So like uh, Giannis just had a quote the other day when he was talking about how he's like, he doesn't think he's as talented as Steph Curry or KD. And so he is obsessed with like not letting them outwork him. 
And so like, I wrote his agent that day and was just like, I want to come talk to him about this thing. So it's very much things I'm curious about. Uh, I don't think there's such a thing as a good idea or a bad idea. I think there's an idea that you're interested in and one that you're not. And I think that if you're not, it, 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 it doesn't matter, you know, and, and uh, uh, so it's just things I'm curious about is, is kind of the gig. Uh, and then every now and then they're like, you know, you have to go do this, which is, you know, which I actually like. Cause like, I, I do think you end up becoming a parody of yourself if you only do things that perfectly fit your eye. So I kind of like the assignment just to keep me from hacking out. Yeah, in the back and then up front. Oh, that's a good question. The question is, does the writing process energize or exhaust? Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to cop out, but both. Uh, I mean, I just wrote for the last three hours, uh, pretty intense. And so like, I'm sort of flying because it went really well, but like my brain hurts. Like, I feel like I'm having trouble putting sentences together, you know, and like, uh, I think if you asked me like a re if somebody asked me like a really complex thing, I'm not sure I could answer it, you know, because like my head hurts. Uh, so both, uh, you know, and I always listen to music when I'm writing, and so even now I can still hear the songs in my head. Uh, What's the writing play playlist? This is gonna be embarrassing. I'll read it to you. Oh my God, it's my. All right, I'll tell you, it is the writing playlist is Thousands Are Sailing by the Pogues, Lil Boosie Show the World, The Foggy Dew, The Chieftains, Cumberland Gap, Jason Isbell in the 400 unit, Little Motel, Modest Mouse, Jacksonville Skyline, Whiskey Town, Drive by Truckers Never Gonna Change, Bobby Jean, Bruce Springsteen, Wonderwall, Oasis, Jumpman, Drake, uh, Million Reasons, Lady Gaga. It's embarrassing, but it's on there. I mean, it's just whatever. There it is. Uh, New York by St. Vincent, Champagne Supernova by Oasis, What's the Frequency, Kenneth R.E.M., Alabama Pines, Jason Isbell, Boys of Summer, Don Henley, Tuesday's Gone, Leonard Skinner, Dire Straits Brothers in Arms, Justin Timberlake, Mirrors. I don't know why. I pick them and move songs off of them. But like that's the current list. Uh, so I was singing the Whiskey Town in my head because it was the one when he walked up. God, I probably shouldn't tell people that. You always want your music to be cooler than it is. I'm just glad there's not a Taylor Swift song on there because there, there is a lot. I love Taylor Swift. Yes. Oh yes, Jordan, Jordan loved him some Whitney. I think he also loved him some actual Whitney. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, what is your number one tip on being a successful I think there used to be like one or two answers to that. And now I think there are 50 answers to that. So I would say, I mean, there are two things to do. There is slot into one of the sort of silos that exist. And there are many more of those than there were like when I started. So you could, you could be a local radio guy, a national radio guy. You could be, you know, uh, you could be Stephen A. Smith or you could be Scott Van Pelt. You could, uh, you could be me or you could be Adam Schefter. Or you could be Jeff Passan, who's kind of both. You know, I mean, there, there are a thousand different things you could choose. So, I mean, one, you sort of, Pick the thing that feels like the best combination of your interest, or invent your own thing. You know, there was no Bill Simmons. Like, no one was doing that. The Boston Herald wouldn't hire Bill Simmons. And now, I don't even know if there is a Boston Herald, and Bill Simmons is worth $400 million. You know, it's like, so I, I would be wary of anybody telling you, there is no Dow, like there is no one true way. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, 
people who hire prioritize news. So that's a good way to get your foot in the door and then pivot to something else you might want to do. Uh, it's sort of, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I hope that answers a little, but I don't think there's, you know, the other thing is just start doing it. You know, people come up all the time and say, I want to, you know, work in sports media. And then I always ask them, well, are you working for the college paper? Are you working for the local, the, the campus TV station? And if the answer is no, you're full of shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, there, there are plenty of ways to do it. There. Oh, I saw you guys last night. No, I walk. I, I've walked away from a, from from things when I was just like, this isn't interesting at all. So, what did you like? How do you approach that with a person that you interview, saying I don't know what I'm doing? Usually, they're at a high enough level that they forget about me, like I forget about them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't. I've never had anybody be like weird about it. Uh, you know, and I mean like. I spent a long time, for instance, on a Dabo Swinney story that I just killed. Because I was just like, this is not interesting. Uh, and uh, so yeah, like it's not always. I mean, I think I have it here somewhere. I th you know what, I do. I, I don't ever erase emails, which is really one day gonna get me into legal trouble. Uh, but let me. All right, so this is the original email I wrote to Michael Jordan, or to his person. So this is October 19th, 2012. Last year, someone mentioned to me that Michael Jordan was approaching his 50th birthday, and to be real honest, my first reaction was selfish. I felt old. Then I thought about a story I read on Paul McCartney in The New Yorker, which was titled, When I'm 64. It paints a picture of a day in his present life, showing what happens after the major work of an incredibly successful and iconic person is done. What does Paul McCartney do for act two? How does he handle his growing understanding of what it meant to have been a Beatle? The story really struck a chord with people. I think everyone who grew up with the Beatles found added layers of meaning. My God, if Paul McCartney is 64, what does that make me? For people between the ages of 30 and 45, this was 11 years ago, for whom Michael is our generation's Paul McCartney, I think his 50th birthday prompts a similar period of reflection. It is with this spirit that I want to write a story that looks at Michael on the eve of 50. This will run on or around the birthday itself, and it's something I'm going to reg write regardless of whatever cooperation you feel comfortable with. <laughs> that was the, got to have a carrot and a stick. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you just make an earnest pitch. Yes, sir. You know, I mean, I was in Ukraine a lot in the past year. Uh, not a lot, I was there twice, but it was, for, it, it felt like a lot to me. Uh, I, you know, uh, and that was one I almost was like, this is really dumb. Uh, uh, you know, I was in Iraq in 06, and it was crazy. It's like, you know, it was like apocalypse now. Uh, not for me, I was on a fob that had a Taco Bell, which was wild, you know? Like, it was like the disconnect between, you know, my totally safe bubble where I literally could go get a chalupa and what was outside the wire really, that was, I didn't like that. I killed a story uh, a couple years ago. There was a Little League team from Matamoros, Mexico that finished second in the Little League World Series and uh, so, and on the 10 year anniversary of that, uh, I went and found every single member of that team and sort of wrote about the border. But uh, a couple of them were in the United States, uh, a couple were playing college baseball and didn't have papers. And I sort of thought that like, if I run this thing, I'm gonna nuke somebody's life. 
It's like the Appalachian Trail, take nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints. Like, I just don't like the idea that I'm messing up somebody's life. Uh, Yes, I, we were embedded with the national soccer team. Uh, it was wild. Uh, uh, I mean, it was also like, it was like the coolest shit I'd ever seen because we, we were sitting outside, and just ordered a beer at this outdoor cafe. It was me and one of my cameramen. And uh, we made a doc, uh, an hour long documentary too. And everybody's, they, we're in this big square and it's just totally packed. And then all of a sudden the air raid sirens start going off. And then there are these announcements being made from these speakers in Ukrainian, but I don't speak Ukrainian. And I'm just like, I looked at Mac and I'm like, this is. And then I, everyone stood up in mass and all started moving together. And I'm like, well, I think we should definitely follow them. So we all let, we, everybody went and we went into this coffee shop and then we went down into the basement and underneath the city, there are all these old World War II bomb shelters. We all just sat down there. The waiters from the coffee shop, because, you know, capitalism lives, man, they came down there and were taking people's coffee orders and then coming back down with coffee. And then after about 45 or 50 minutes, uh, the all clear sounded and we everybody went back out into the square and just continued as if nothing had happened. Like it was just like, I've always wondered what London would have been like during the Blitz and it's like that, you just get on with it. Uh, so we spent a bunch of time there, and it was, you know, anyway, that, I, it was very, very cool. Uh, and Kiev, it's just relentless in it, its determination to not stop working. So, like, you know, there's a great sort of hipster cocktail bar culture and really nice restaurants you have to make reservations for, even while it's getting shelled. And, you know, you can get a taxi, you know, and there's a strict curfew. So like people drink hard because you got to leave, you know. So every, it's really interesting. Uh, it's just a cool sort of, you know, to watch people live. Uh, you know, we took the we had, we drove in because you can't fly. We had these badass ex British SAS guys who were security. They were, you know, it's fun. They had good stories, and. Uh, the play, it was just, I don't know, it felt like a Graham Greene novel. What do we got? Uh, you, and then you, and then you. All right, go ahead. Uh, I know you're from rural Mississippi. I am too. Uh, Where? Chickasaw County. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we think of ourselves as the Delta East. Yeah. Uh, but been everywhere since then. Uh, what, what do you think people get wrong about Mississippi? How much time you have? Uh, I mean, a lot of my book is wrestling with this. I've actually been thinking about a lot of this stuff. I mean, uh, well, first, people get wrong that anything south of Jackson is Mississippi. No, that's just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, I'm from the Delta. I don't even think Tupelo is Mississippi. Uh, you got to claim Elvis. You do have to claim Elvis. I'm coming back to that. Has anybody seen that movie? Yeah. Did we like it? Yeah, I haven't seen it. I've heard really mixed reviews. Yeah. I saw everything all at once, all the time. Is that, what's the name of it? Everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was really good. I, I, and you, I might, you might actually know this. I could not figure out the internal logic of it. I haven't seen it yet. The, uh, aren't you the film teacher? <laughs> this is what, that reflects on you. These are his parents who obviously failed. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I mean, I, you know, that every Mississippian is Ross Barnett. I had here and then back here. One of my favorite sports venues. Sports venue? Yeah. 
Oh, uh, it's either, it's either Azteca in Mexico City, Old Trafford in Manchester, or Tiger Stadium in Baton Rouge. Tiger Stadium's I've been everywhere to see everything. I've seen India play Pakistan in the Cricket World Cup. Like, I've seen everything. The loudest thing I have ever heard in my life is Tiger Stadium. We were there. They were playing. There was a game. Uh, LSU was playing number one Alabama and had a, like, it was a TV timeout, and there was a, like, a drive with a shot to win the game. And I was standing next to someone on the sideline down in the LSU student section. And we were screaming in each other's ears and couldn't hear. It's a loud thing. I mean, it's crazy. Like, you know, uh, I was there one time, and before the game, uh, they thought it would be a good idea if they filmed an episode of Ripley's Believe It or Not. And so they brought in this really cute little girl. She was like nine, and her whole thing was she could shoot a bow and arrow with her feet. And so they set up a target on the goalpost down where the student section is. You know, the student section, it's two hours before kickoff, and it's packed. And they've been drinking for years. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it, you could smell the whiskey on the field. That's not a joke. Like, that's not like you can literally smell the whiskey on the field. And so this poor girl shoots the bow and arrow. Dean Kane's there. He's the host of it. She hits the target. It's a square target, but misses the circle. And the entire LSU student body starts chanting at the nine-year-old girl, overrated. <laughs> and I was just like, I mean, God, what, you know, I love it. It's my favorite place to go to a game. I mean, I, it, and I'm an old Miss fan, so like that aggrieves me deeply to say out loud, because I buried my father with a button that said, go to hell, LSU. <laughs> Like, I don't, I am not predisposed to liking that cultish bullshit they got going on over there, but it's incredible. It's incredible. Yes? There is. Next. <laughs> uh, it's much more feel and length. Like, there's a reason that the Billy Varner one is, the Cubs one and the Billy Varner one are right around the Saints one. Because if I've just done that to you, i got to give you a little bit of a break. Yes, sir. What is your favorite sport to cover? I mean, if... College, I mean, college football, I'd like to make, but like, I, I love college football. Uh, I, uh, although it's interesting because like, you know, a five-year-old and a two-year-old are not remotely interested in watching a college football game. So like, I watch a lot more Bluey on Saturday now than I do college football. Uh, but, you know, I TiVo them and then I watch them later alone. And then I, I erase all the Ole Miss losses, but I keep the wins, and then I go back and watch them again. If there's an Egg Bowl I've watched 30 times. We're bad at football. I don't know if you got the memo. What do we got? Yes. Uh, usually, because like, I mean, human beings are simple creatures, but like, you know, don't chase too hard. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's just a, in every avenue of life, it's kind of a turnoff. Like something must, you know, it's like, we're all, we're all insecure enough to think like if this part, like, this, per, something's, this person is deeply flawed if they think I'm awesome. Yes, sir. Uh, did you get to go to Omaha? Or all I did not go to Omaha uh, because uh, I, I 
I didn't go early to like the first, you know, the first week of it, because I just was like, we're just gonna go out there and lose. And then I felt like that attitude deserved some sort of punishment. <laughs> and that because I wasn't like all in the first week, that I didn't deserve the victory lap. So like somebody literally, I mean, it's Oxford. Somebody was like, we're flying out in a Gulf Stream. Do you want to ride? And I was like, I, I, I don't, I, I can't do it. Because I didn't, I just felt like, uh, but if Ole Miss ever goes to Atlanta, I don't give a shit what I said, I'm going. That's interesting. I mean, I probably like the Grove only because I grew up with it. The Grove, here's the dirty little secret. Uh, let me cover this microphone because this can't be broadcast. The Grove is a little too right now in love with itself. And so as it, it, the thing that it never was was mannered or self-conscious. And now it feels like it's trying too hard. Like I grew up and like, no one has chandeliers. That was all bullshit. That was like somebody put one on TV once and now people are doing it. It's like life imitating art. You know, like when I was a kid, we could park cars in the Grove and we literally ate out of our trunks. And so like, I liked that and I liked that it's sort of a big family reunion and that I'll have four generations of my family at my thing. Uh, you know, I think the Grove is certainly easier to get to because I can walk from my house and you know, getting to and out of an LSU game is like, it's the worst thing in the world. I won't do it unless I have like, like a really great parking pass because like I'm just not doing it. Like, you know, if I can't park at the PMAC, I'm not doing that shit. Uh, Cause it's just too, it's crazy. I'm not walking down Nicholson, you know, like lugging stuff. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, so my friend Ragu used to have a big tailgate at uh, LSU, the big Ragu. Uh, so I liked going to that because it like it was a place to go. Uh, I guess I think everybody thinks their tailgates are better, and my experience is that every tailgate is almost exactly the same. That like, you know where they burn it down? University of Washington, USC, uh, Notre Dame, LSU. Well, everywhere is sort of Notre Dame's cool. One of the things about Notre Dame is like. Notre Dame is so earnest. Like everybody wears Notre Dame sweatshirts who goes to Notre Dame, you know? Like that's all they wear. Like everybody's just pumped to be at Notre Dame. I went to Notre Dame. You did go to Notre Dame? Well then you know, you're like it's unbelievable. Like, we have so many sweatshirts. <laughs> no, that's the, yeah, that's what I mean. You're not wrong. No, it's just like, I went to Missouri. I don't, I, I don't own a single Missouri sweatshirt. I'm not wearing that around. Christmas gets ideas from my mom. Oh, it's a great Notre Dame mom. Yeah. I fried a turkey with Chris Zarich once. Yes. Did you ever think about pursuing fiction, or was it always like supporting creative nonfiction? I have tried, and everything I do is real bad. <laughs> I don't see how people make it up. Like, it's such a crutch that I could be like, "Well, it didn't happen." You know, with the only limit is your imagination. Uh, no, I find it really hard. I mean, I, I you know, I flirted around with it because I was like, I don't have to get on airplanes if I write fiction, but no. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, awesome. A lot of us around here are uh, really excited about AI. Is that yeah. you, you competing with yourself? Or you have to write something about the cloud wi uh, My boss did it to all of us the other day. Yeah. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> no, no, it was it was ludicrous. Like it doesn't it didn't work for anybody. Uh, I know because I was real nervous when I opened that email because I'm like, Chat GBT costs a lot less than I do. Uh, but no, I mean, but that stuff's terrifying. I mean, I'm also like, I'm the wrong person to ask about technology because I'm like super fearful of technology. So like, I, I don't, I always preface it by saying like, I'm not, I'm not the guy you want deciding this stuff because I think get rid of all of it. Uh, although, I mean, it is interesting. I, I've always wondered like, why, I've always wondered, for instance, like why the Amish are okay with the wheel, but not with the engine? Because aren't they both pieces? Like, what's the difference really between a wheel and the space shuttle? 
I mean, other than degree. And so, like, I've always wondered, like, how do you randomly pick, you know, like, what's the difference between a styrofoam cup and a 3D printer? I mean, they, like, you know, so I've, I've always wondered, like, anyway. Remember the TI-82 or whatever it was called you had to buy? I never learned how to work that. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you think more people should get more of an Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, yes. This is, I could go down this rabbit hole. You don't want that. <laughs> Did I win? Did I talk everybody out? <laughs> we got some, what do we got? Then let's continue the conversation so we're dinner. What is the dinner? I don't know. What's the dinner? Fuck yes. Thanks everybody. Let's get gumbo.